Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural seminar of our science-based webinar series. Today's presenter is Dr. Joanna Makowska. Dr. Makowska obtained her PhD from the University of British Columbia's Animal Welfare Program, where her work focused on laboratory rat housing and how it affects rat welfare. Shortly after receiving her PhD, Dr. Makowska won the prestigious National Center for the Replacement, Refinement, and Reduction of Animals and Research Award. Dr. Makowska is an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia and a laboratory animal advisor at the Animal Welfare Institute, which is a charitable nonprofit organization founded in 1951 with the goal of reducing pain and fear inflicted on animals by humans. Dr. Makowska is also the director at large for the Animals and Science Policy Institute and a consultant for the BC SPCA. Animal Care Systems is privileged to host this webinar for her today. The title of her presentation is The Challenges and Solutions for Laboratory at Rodent Housing. If you have a question for Dr. Makowska during the seminar, please use the question pane in the control panel, and we will answer as many questions as we can after the seminar. Dr. Makowska, the audience is yours. Thanks, Austin. All right, um, so for today's presentation, there we go. I'm gonna start with a really brief agenda just so you know kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna start with a tiny background on what is animal welfare, or at least what do I mean when I'm talking about welfare. Um, I'm then gonna go into some research that I did on housing for rats, uh, then some research on playpens for rats, and finally um, some research on housing for mice. So what is animal welfare? There's a few definitions out there, but the one that's quite commonly used, um, developed by Fraser et al, is that there are three domains to welfare, um, and these are biological functioning, effective states, and natural behaviors. Um, biological functioning just means functioning well, so being healthy, not having any injuries. Effective states relates to feeling well, so the absence of pain, fear, frustration, but also experiencing some positive emotions such as joy and contentment. And finally, leading a natural life, which is basically being able to engage in some naturally motivated behaviors and not exhibiting any abnormal behaviors. These three domains are really interrelated and good welfare lies in the balance of these three spheres. So for example, if you have an, a mouse that is in pain, that will translate into poor nest building. Um, you're gonna see a decrease in how well they built those nests. So that affects um, these natural behaviors. Having poor nest building skills can lead to cold stress, uh, which then affects physiological functioning and then further again will engender discomfort from the cold. So you can see how all these three spheres are kind of playing into each other. Just another example, let's say you have a mouse that is anxious. Um, we know that anxiety acts on the body and leads to a weakened immune system. We know that anxiety also can engender barbering in mice. Um, if a mouse has a weakened immune system and does this barbering and then that leads to maybe some skin piercing, um, you can then also have a higher risk of infection. So again, all of these spheres affect each other. And the anxiety itself that we just spoke about could have itself arisen either from a housing system that thwarts natural behavior. So this mouse is anxious because she's not able to exhibit what she's motivate, motivated to do. Or it could also be based on genetics because um, we do breed animals to be prone to anxiety, for example, for, for different types of research. So like I said before, this welfare, good welfare really lies at this intersection of where these three kind of balance each other out. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about housing for rats now. This is um, research that I did for my PhD. And the reason I was interested in housing is that it really is the most pervasive element of an animal's life. Um, and this is especially true for rodents who are nocturnal because unless they're housed on a reverse light cycle, when they're awake and they're going about the day, there's nobody around. They're really, it's them in their cage. And so that cage and what's in it really sets the limits of, of the animal's experiences. So this is a video. It was shot during the dark period. Um, and as you see, the rats aren't doing much. But this is, I think, the way we came to be used to seeing rats in labs. Um, we come to think of them as sedentary animals. I've heard people say that they're lazy, that they don't really want to do much. Um, 
but I'd seen differently, you know, and, and maybe you guys have seen this, this video as well. It's now available on YouTube called Rat Life. I highly suggest to go check it out if you want. Um, basically, Manuel Berdoy from Oxford University took laboratory rats, laboratory bred rats, um, and released them into a fenced yard. And within, you know, minutes, the animals just dispersed, started making burrows, living in um, tunnel systems, they were climbing, they're doing all these behaviors. So we know they have the ability, or at least the motivation to do these other behaviors if they're in a different environment. So what I wanted to do was to house animals in an environment that would allow them to exhibit more natural behaviors and see kind of what happens and what they would choose to do um, to kind of gauge their motivation to engage in these other behaviors. So I house them in these large cages that are very popular with pet rat owners. Um, it allowed rats to do some climbing and I had burrowing substrate in the bottom. Um, I used soil and also had a standard control group uh, that were housed in standard cages and pairs. I used newly weaned sprag dolly rats that I ordered from Charles River, Canada. And upon arrival, the rats were randomly assigned to house and treatment. So either the large cage, um, semi-naturalistic environment or the controlled standard treatment. So here's a video that I shot at the same time as I shot the previous video, um, just showing you how starkly different the rats are um, when they're living in a different environment. So if you observe, you can see the rats are doing lots of climbing, they're doing exploration. I would put some treats in the PVC tube, so that's what that rat was just doing, checking it out. So I then set out to quantify some of the behaviors that the rats house in the semi-naturalistic cages were doing. Um, those rats had been filmed continuously with infrared cameras um, for about two years. And I decided to score the, be the behaviors that seem really frequent, um, but are not actually possible in standard cages. And those three behaviors were burrowing, climbing, and standing upright. And what I mean by upright standing is not just a rear, but a full on um, legs outstretched and back fully straight, which rats cannot do in a standard cage. And I scored these three behaviors when the rats were three months old, eight months old, and 13 months old to get some um, data on developmental changes. So here's a video of what burrowing looked like. In this case, um, the rat was building her tunnel right in the front of the cage behind the plexiglass. So we get a good shot of what that looks like inside the tunnel. So here's some data, what we found. Um, so on the x-axis, you have the age of the rats when they were three, eight or 13 months old. And on the y-axis, you have the frequency of, of the burrowing behavior per rat per day. Um, what we found is that rats burrowed about 30 times per day. And that there was not significant difference in terms of frequency as the rats age. That stayed pretty consistent. So what this suggests to us is that Burrowing looks like it's a particularly important behavior to rats. And the reason I say that is rats um, and humans and pretty much every other animal become less active with age. So as we get older, we'll train some behaviors that are not as important to us for rest. Um, so think of, of children. They're bouncing off the walls, they're running around, spending tons of energy. And as we age, we're perfectly happy to have a, a sit down dinner party or to watch television more. So in this case, what we found is that rats did become less active. They traded a lot of behaviors, but not burrowing. That was one behavior that they kept up and kept performing at about 25 to 30 times per day. We also found some indications that burrowing might actually induce positive welfare or, or be associated with this um, emotion that we, we quantified as excitement. Um, and the reason we say that is the rat's demeanor um, as they were burrowing. So often they'd be, let's say, they'd be sleeping in the hammock up in the upper part of the cage, and then they just kind of spring up and sprint down and start burrowing. And as they were burrowing in and out of the tunnels, they would be doing this bounding behavior um, that we know is indicative of a very positive state in rats. 
um, what we also found is that rats were constantly burrowing, even though there were already tunnels present. So they seem to be doing it for the sake of doing it and not just for the purpose of having a tunnel, um, because they kept building new tunnels, even though the old ones were still there. Here's a video of climbing. We found that rats would do this either to seemingly explore, just to kind of travel on the wall, or to travel from one place to the other. So um, this is a similar graph with age on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. Um, there's a stark difference with what we saw with burrowing. Um, so what we see is that when the rats were young, uh, but at three months of age, they burrowed about 75 times per day. Uh, sorry, they climbed about 75 times per day, which is quite frequent. Uh, but that rate really decreased um, dramatically as the rats got older. Um, we think that they may have decreased climbing because of physical ability. That's certainly a factor. Um, at 13 months old, you know, you'd see them trying to climb, but they would kind of lose their grip and fall. Uh, so they just didn't have that strength anymore. Um, the take home message here is that at three months old, which is really the age um, at which rats are usually kept in laboratories, it is a behavior that they performed quite frequently. Um, and it's rare that we keep the rats for longer um, in, in the laboratory, but at least for these young rats, it seems that like climbing should be something that, that we should provide them the ability to do. And here's upright standing. So there is, we, we identified two types of upright standing. So in this one, I want you to pay attention to the rat's head. And what you can notice is that she is sniffing. Uh, she seems to be moving her nose. We call this an exploratory um, upright standing. So she seems to be doing this in order to explore, kind of sniff what's going on in the upper sides of the cage. Contrast this to the right side of the cage. This is a stretch. You can see the little paw out, yawn, and paw out stretch and the yawn. Here you see it again. So this is a stretch. Um, so out of all of the, the upright standing behaviors, we found that the exploration was about 20, 80% of the time and the stretching was about 20% of the time. So I want you to keep that in mind for um, a few minutes later. Okay, so here's a graph of the daily frequency of upright standing. Um, what we found is that it was by far the most common behavior of the three that we looked at. Um, when the rats were young, they stood upright about 180 times per day, and they still did it about 80 times per day, even when they were 13 months old. Uh, and that translates about every four minutes when they were three months old uh, of, of the time when they were awake, and still every 10 minutes um, when they were older. So looking at these results have led me to have a follow-up question. Um, and that was that because standard house rats, they cannot stretch upright, they just don't have that height, um, I hypothesized that they would compensate for this inability to stretch upright by performing more lateral stretches. Um, and that just looks like the photos that you see at the bottom, kind of what our cats or dogs would do at home. So to look at that hypothesis, I compared the frequency of lateral stretching uh, between the standard house rats and the semi-metrialistic house rats when the rats were 13 months old. And what we found is indeed um, these standard house rats stretched about eight times more um, frequently in the lateral position than the semi-naturalistic house rats. That seemed like a huge amount. Um, so I then added up the um, amount of all stretching in the semi-naturalistic cages. So the bottom, the green bar, is how much lateral stretching if the semi-naturalistic rats did. The blue bar is how much of that upright stretching they did. And still, we found that all of that stretching was still about a third of the amount um, that we saw of lateral stretching in the standard animals. So this led us to believe that this inability to stretch upright um, in the standard rats does not alone account for the really high rates of lateral stretching that we saw, um, and that something else seems to be going on with these standard house rats. Um, if you look at the literature on stretching and some of its purposes, um, one of them is that it's a corrective response to stiffness that is caused by positional stress or immobility. So the implication here seems to be that this low mobility in standard cages, um, as well as the inability to stretch upright or to stand upright, may be leading to stiffness and positional stress, which the rats are then attempting to alleviate through really frequent stretching. So conclusion from this study uh, was that it seems that laboratory 
standard laboratory rat housing is preventing rats from performing some important natural behaviors that they would perform quite frequently if they had the opportunity to do. And there is some evidence, I mean, and this needs to be followed up with um, more empirical studies, but there is some evidence that uh, standard cages are, are cramped in, in some way. So I'm going to lead into a different study now, and that one is on playpens for rats. Uh, the reason I'm interested in this idea is that this complex housing, the semi-naturalistic housing that I just described, is not always an option. Um, there are monetary constraints. There are space constraints. Um, basically, it's, people are not going to start housing the rats in these larger cages um, anytime soon. So this other idea, um, I heard of it for the first time from a lady named Kate Chenton, uh, who is a scientist at AstraZeneca UK. And so she at their, their facility have rats that live in standard cages, but they are given intermittent access to a large enriched area. So that's the idea of this playpen. It's this large enriched area that the animals can get into to play um, at, at various intervals. So what Kate Shenton did at AstraZeneca, they just had a rabbit exercise pen that was sitting there empty. They weren't using it. And so she had the idea to take that and just outfit it with a bunch of things that the rats would found would find cool. Um, and then we'll put the rats in there. So this is her video. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is that everything in this pipe is things that were already in the facility. So this cost exactly zero dollars. Um, you can use some crinkle paper, some fill some tubs with water, use empty glove boxes, um, some toilet paper rolls. And at her facility, these are male rats that were pair housed, um, but she would put them in the playpen for a couple of hours a day um, in groups of 10 to 12. So she would mix different groups and she's never seen any aggression. And they believe it's because the rats were so busy exploring and just having fun in the playpen that they, were, they weren't um, engaging in any aggression. She said the rats were quite scared of the water at first, um, but with time they started going in there and taking little little baths um, and groom, do some grooming of themselves in there. All right. Um, at my facility at the University of British Columbia, my colleague, um, I told her about the playpen idea. She loved it. She was running some other studies with the rats, um, looking at some personal personality differences um, in response to euthanasia agents, so something completely unrelated, but decided to give her standard house rats access to a playpen as well. So this is the image of the playpen that Lucia used. Um, just wanted you to pay attention to, she also, she, she included some burrowing substrate, but to make it a little more manageable than what I had, um, she put that in a smaller plexiglass bin that was at the bottom. I'm gonna show you a video of what her playpen looked like. So here she is bringing the rats over to the playpen. And she did it mixed group. So these guys were just went in with their home, um, home cage fellows. What you see here is um, some bobbing for peas. So you might have seen some YouTube videos of pet rats give, give, being given some frozen peas that float in water and rats really enjoy doing that. So they'll spend a lot of time just fishing for that. Here they are using the burrowing substrate. What we found is in a playpen, they'll do a lot of digging and playing around, but they'll never build um, complex tunnel systems the way they do when they live with the soil in their cage. So and one thing about the soil is that you need to water it every once in a while because it tends to dry out and then you can't really form tunnels anymore. So one day they started spraying the soil um, to, to make it a little moist and their rats started playing with it. So it was really cute. Um, since then it became also kind of a um, rat-human interaction. Um, moment when the rats are in the playpen and they seem to really enjoy playing with, with that water being sprayed. So that's just a full view of the playpen. All right, so 
The playpen idea, while it is new to me, um, it's actually been in place for quite some years with different species. So non-human primates have been given access to play cages or activity cages, as they're called, um, since the 80s, really. Um, so, for example, one study looked at the benefits of giving um, some, I believe these were baboons, access to a play cage. So they had single house baboons that were placed in a play cage that was four times the size of their home cage. Um, that play cage had some stationary movable toys, it had movable perches, it had a food puzzle. And in this study, they put the baboons um, in the play cage for 48 hours, every, like once a month. So basically two days out of the month, the baboons got to stay in there. And here are the results of what they found. So they found that while the animals were in the play cage, the expression of abnormal behaviors went down, the cage directed aggression went down, and activity went down, and the use of enrichment went way up. They did find, however, that once the animals are back in their home cages, um, all of these differences seem to go away. But really there were benefits of spending time in that play cage. So I started a study in my postdoc just to look at some of the benefits or whether there are benefits um, to giving rats access to play pens. So what I did is I had the standard house rats they are about a year old uh, when I got them. And half of them were given access to a play pen. Um, this play pen, again, is very similar to the cages I've used so far and shown you so far. The one main difference, I guess, is there was a water tray on the middle shelf, um, and it was just a paint tray. And I thought it was a cool idea. I read that on a pet rat forum. Um, so it starts out really shallow, but then it goes deeper. So the rats um, can go deep if they want, or they can just sit in the shallow end. Um, and then the other half, uh, randomly allocated to treatment, got to just go into another standard cage that was identical to their home cage to control for that transfer of going into a new space. I also had two play pens. Um, they, they were identical except for the fact that the burrowing substrate was different in them. Um, so the soil, we know the rats really like it. They use it a lot, but it is messy. So when they dig around, they'll, they'll throw it outside of the cage. So there's a lot of sweeping going on. Um, and we also have to water it. Um, so as an alternative, I wanted to try something that's called like wood wool or excel syrup. Um, it's basically just thin filaments of wood. Um, in this case, it's aspen chip, natural and undyed. Um, and basically, we just wanted to kind of have this study within the playpen study, just looking at how the rats would be using this burrowing substrate. OK, so um, quick study details. We use mature female spag dolly rats. Um, they were given access to the playpens for about an hour a day, four times per week for five weeks. Um, and they were placed in those treatment cages, so the standard control cage or the playpen, um, in their home pairs or trio. So we didn't mix groups. However, we didn't clean out the playpens or the control cages between groups. So like for the entire study, for the whole five weeks, we didn't clean that out, which means that the rats could smell each other um, when they went into the playpen. They could smell the other groups that had been in there, and same for the control cage. So some of the welfare outcomes that we looked at, we looked at things before accessing the play pens and control cages, during and after. So before we have the question, is access to play pens more rewarding than access to controls? And the quick answer is yes, we found evidence that it is. Um, how we did this is we used anticipatory behavior as a measure of the value of the reward. Um, so the value of going into play pen versus a control cage. Just going to explain disturbed behavior really quickly. Um, it's a really straightforward concept that you probably have going on with your pets at home. Um, it's basically the animals learn to associate some cue with something fun that's coming up. So let's say you open the fridge or you crinkle the treat bag and your dog or your cat knows that this means, yay, treat is coming. Um, or you grab the leash or put on your shoes and your dog knows, oh, I'm going for a walk. Um, and when, when they hear that cue or see that cue, they get really excited, they get up, they start walking around you, they get quite active. So this is, so that, that increased activity um, that the animals exhibit um, when, when a cue is signaling a reward is what we call anticipatory behavior. So what I did in my study, the rats would be um, given a sound cue. So they're in their home cages, they're given a sound cue, we wait five minutes, record their behavior, and then transfer them to the treatment cage. So those five minutes 
become this um, anticipatory behavior. And the way you measure how active they get is you look at the frequency of different behavioral elements. So how many behaviors, how often do they transition? So this is how you can quantify how active they get. And there's data to support that the more active they get, the more rewarding they find um, what's coming up. So here's um, the results on the X axis. You have my two treatments. You have rats that are going into the control versus rats that are about to go into the playpen. Um, on the Y axis, you have the number of behaviors per minute that each rat was exhibiting. So I did this at baseline. So it mean, this means this is the very first day of the study. The rats had never been to a playpen or a control cage. They didn't know what was coming up. They heard a cue. Cue meant nothing. We measured how active they were just to get a baseline of how active these particular groups of rats were. Um, and then after the five weeks, we did this again once they really knew what that sound cue meant. Um, and what we found is that the rats that were going into the playpen were significantly more active than they were at baseline, whereas the control rats um, did increase their behavior a little bit, but this wasn't significantly different. All right, so the next thing we did is we also filmed the rats during um, their time in the playpens and in the control cages. Um, and things we were looking at um, were, did they engage with the environment? Did the rats going to the playpen find the environment interesting? Did they use the space or did they not really care about it, find the irrelevance and not really do anything? Um, we also looked at whether they were displaying specific behaviors that were associated with positive welfare. So for example, play. Uh, we know that animals will play when they're in a good mood and there's no threats and no, no negative um, effective states. And we also know that playing will further, it's kind of like a, a, like a loop. They, they'll, they'll do it only if they're in a good state and then playing makes them even be in an even better state. So quick answer is yes and yes, we did find evidence of both. Um, the way we looked, uh, we scored behaviors was we did some scan sampling every two minutes um, while the animals were in the treatment. What we found is that in the playpens, the rats did use the entire cage, but they really did seem to favor the burrowing substrate. So they spent um, about 45% of their time interacting with that burrowing substrate. And that was, there was no difference um, whether the, the burrowing substrate was soil or the wood wool, which is really cool. Um, we also found when we compared how much play we saw in the playpens versus the control cages, we found that social play was four times as frequent in the playpens um, than the control standard cages. In terms of the behaviors that we saw them exhibiting, um, I want you to pay attention to the two, the dark blue and the kind of purpley light blue colors. Um, these are rearing and sniffing. Um, so these are the really kind of what the rats did in the control cages. They, they reared and sniffed uh, the entire time. And to contrast that with what they did in the playpen, um, you can see rearing sniffing was quite frequent as well, but a lot less. And what was now the most frequent behaviors were walking in purple and not visible. And what that not visible was, um, was really they were in the burrowing substrate. They were running around um, digging tunnels and burrowing. So finally, we also looked at welfare outcomes after. So we wanted to look at whether once the rats are back in their home cages, kind of the other 23 hours of the day, um, do we have indication that they have improved welfare? So what we looked at here were two things. Um, the first one was stretching rate. So we wanted to see whether that one hour in the playpen uh, might translate into less stretching once they're back in their home cages. Um, we did not find a difference. Um, another thing we looked at is different behaviors associated with positive and negative welfare in the home cages. So positive welfare, again, we looked at play, we looked at allo grooming, um, some other kinds of affiliative behaviors that we know are positive. Um, we also looked at rates of aggression. The analysis here is ongoing. We only did a very small sample size. Uh, it seems so far that there are very few differences, but possibly more affiliative behaviors in the playpen group. But I believe we need to score the rest of um, our sample to know, definitely. So still a question mark here. So summary um, of this preliminary analysis of this playpen study, what we found so far is that yes, rats seem to want to go into the playpens. It's something that we have um, evidence to show that if they find rewarding, that they're excited to go in there. 
Um, we found that once in the clay pins, they really do interact with them. Um, they exhibit lots of clay behaviors. They use the entire space. Um, but perhaps the benefits um, might not really extend much beyond access to the clay pen, but we're still not quite sure. Um, and the one thing I wanted to also say is that given the design of our study, how we didn't clean the cages, um, I think even our control cage had a little bit of benefits. It was still a break in the routine. They would go into this um, small space, but the space was more interesting in the home cage because it smelled like the other rats and the rats, like, like you saw, did a lot of sniffing in there. Okay, so I'm gonna now talk about the final study that I did, which is um, a study with mice. And a very different topic. Um, we're gonna talk about separate areas for resting and soiling, so elimin elimination behavior. We know that this separation of the latrine and sleeping areas is prevalent across the entire animal kingdom. So you see evidence of this behavior in in bees and crickets and aphids. Um, you see caterpillar larvae actually even have this um, mechanism where they use hydrostatic pressure to expel their fecal pellets up to 40 body lengths away from them. And you have this, I really like this example, the um, leaf cutting ant. They will always defecate and urinate outside of their nest. Um, they leave little piles outside where you see the yellow arrows. And then on top of that, they have designated waste worker ants who will carry the waste farther away um, from the entrance to the nest. Um, you go into the birds and they also, you have the parents will always carry the fecal sacs of their young out of the nest as soon as they're, they're there. Um, you have a burrowing species um, of birds. The puffin also has a designated latrine at the entrance to, to their burrow. Um, and we found examples of separate burrowing latrine and resting sites among um, lizards and skinks as well. Tons of examples across the mammals as well, elephants, river otters, lemurs, and also many examples among different types of rodents. Um, and then that brings us to the laboratory mouse, um, where when we house them in the laboratory, they are in a little space that is small and not partitioned. So they don't really have an option to separate from their feces and urine. Um, but there is some anecdotal evidence that mice, just like so many other species, would prefer to nest in a clean area that is away from where they eliminate. So some of the anecdotal evidence is, for example, um, you, you get to some technicians' journals and um, two, two different people actually added some bottles to mouse cages just as enrichment for the animals to play with. But what they found is that the mice exclusively use those bottles either as enclosed latrines or as enclosed um, nesting sites. You also have Chris Sherwin who who in his experience noted that if you give mice a demarcated area, so in this picture, the example he gave was a glass dish, the mice will tend to use that as a latrine and keep the rest of the cage clean. Another study, um, this is a study where they wanted to look at uh, rat and mouse preferences for bedding types. So they have the central cage um, and every, the four cages with different colors um, just had different types of beddings in them. And so what they found is that the cage that the mice ended up uh, sleeping in, so ended up spending the most time in, it's the cage that was also the least soiled. Um, so they would keep that cage clean and soil the others. And in a very similar setup, um, researchers also looked at uh, mouse preferences for different soiling levels. So same setup, but in this case, the bedding was the same, except that some bedding, some cages had very clean bedding, some cages had bedding that was soiled four days, seven days, and 14 days, I believe. And again, similarly, they found that the cage that the mice spent the most time in and slept in was the one that had the cleanest bedding. Some of the potential consequences of an inability to segregate space, if you're motivated to do, um, we know that in, inability to perform a behavior that you're highly motivated to perform can lead to frustration, anxiety, aggression, and it can lead to abnormal behaviors as well. 
Um, and in contrast, we know that good welfare is associated with affiliative behaviors, and I mentioned that before in the Python study as well. So things like ally grooming, uh, voluntary proximity to your cage mates. Um, and another sign of good welfare in mice especially is uh, locomotion. We know that our mice um, are super active and inactivity is a sign of, of something not being quite right in mice. So the aim of this study uh, were to investigate how mice would set up and use their space in the standard cage versus a complex system. Um, so the system we use here is the animal care systems um, setup just because they have this really neat um, block party um, set up where you can connect several cages. And the second aim was to look at some behavioral indicators of negative and positive welfare in mice housed in either system. So we used female Swiss Webster mice for this study and the center cage just had three mice and the triad had um, also three mice per cage, which really means there were nine mice, mice in the system. So the stocking density was the same. Um, what I also wanna draw your attention to is we used a triple cage system where in every triad, we had one cage that was red and only one cage was provided with food and water. Um, but we gave two types of nesting material in each of the three cages. Data collection was done once per week for 14 weeks during cage changing. So when we change the cages, we would write down the location of urine spots. We would write down the location of the nest and we also would score nest quality. And we had a wonderful technician who was doing this with us. Um, in order to score the location, we subdivided each system into three locations. So if you look um, on the standard photo now, um, so the standard cage was separated into three areas, which had the front left location. You had the front right that contains the water and part of the feeder, and then you had the back of the cage. And for the triads, for the complex system, we just separated into the three cages. So you have the, three, the red cage, the neutral cage, and the food and water cage. We also took photos, um, top view and bottom view of every cage during cage changing. And then later um, hit the identity of the cages and some blind observers scored the soiling level. So looking at feces on the scale of one to five and also bedding coverage. And I'll explain um, why that mattered in a bit, but basically how much bedding was left in the cage again on the scale of one to five. We also recorded mouse behavior over 12 sessions, uh, again, using scan sampling. So we looked at things such as affiliative behaviors, which would be indicative of positive, it's a positive behavior. So we looked at abnormal behaviors, which are negative, and we looked at locomotion, which again, is considered to be positive. We want our mice to be moving more. So in terms of results for segregation of space, or what did mice do? We found that in both systems, uh, mice attempted to segregate space, and that we only found a urine spot um, so basically, the urine spot and the nest were in separate locations 98% of the time. Uh, what that meant in the standard cage is that the urine spot and the nest were in separate corners of the cage. Um, what that meant in the complex system is that the urine spot and the nest were always in different cages 98% of the time. Furthermore, we found in the standard cage that this urine spot, again, 98% of the time was in that front right location, which had the food and water. Um, and the nest was 50-50 among the other two locations and was never found in the water and food location. We also found that feces were uniform throughout the cage, as you can see in this photo. So we can't know for sure whether mice attempted to also defecate in a specific localized area, but we do know um, from previous studies that even if they did, um, just the cage is small, everything's open and the movement of the animals in the cage mixes up the bedding so it would spread throughout the cage. In a complex system, what we found is again, just like in the standard system, the urine spot was 90% of the time in the food and water cage. Um, we found that the nest was 67% of the time in the red cage. And we also found that feces were highly, highly correlated with the urine spot location. So um, both feces and urine were the highest in the latrine cage, which was the food and water cage. Another really unexpected thing is that we found that mice were moving the bedding. So not the nesting material, their actual bedding, 
um, out of the cages where they have their nest and into the latrine cage. So what we found basically at the end of the week during cage changing, often the red cage, which is where they usually nested, was almost completely stripped of bedding, uh, while the latrine cage was piled high with bedding. So for those who like graphs, um, here's just what that looked like. Um, so you have the standard system, the complex system, and the three locations for each on the x-axis. Um, and what I want you to pay attention to is the dark green, which is both. Um, this is the main result is that urine and nest were very, very seldom in the same location. So basically only 2% of the time. Um, and the really high urine only bar is um, in both system in the food and water cage or location. In terms of how bedding coverage and soiling and this quality related to each other, so on the x-axis you have soiling increasing. So zero is um, zero soiling, three is very dirty cage, and on the y-axis you have bedding coverage, zero is there is no bedding, um, three is lots of bedding. So what we have in this graph, what we notice is that as soiling increase as we go towards the 3M soiling and as bedding coverage increases, we don't have a nest. So we have very soil cage, um, tons of bedding, and there is no nest there. So that's a dirty cage. And as you go towards the zero and zero, so you have no bedding left, also but no soiling, so very clean, and that's where you find the really good quality nest. What we found in terms of behaviors is we did find um, in the standard system there was a lot less locomotion um, and there are also fewer affiliative behaviors. Um, and we further found that these affiliative behaviors are really affected by cage change. So this is what this looked like. So I want you to look at day six. So this is kind of the end of the graph. This is when we would come in and change the cage, um, provide a new cage that is clean. Um, you can see from that day and jumping into day zero, you have a really dramatic drop in affiliative behaviors in the standard cage. So they have a certain level and then going to the day right after the cage change, that big disruption, uh, we know mice don't like cage changes, um, there this normal positive affiliative behavior is quite disrupted, it goes way down. Um, and whereas it went decreased a lot less, it was almost similar in, in the complex system. What we also found is this is a weird quadratic effect. So what we found is like, yeah, there's a huge, this, this acute change of cage, dis, of cage changing decreases the behaviors. Um, after that, as the days go by, they kind of resume this more and more and more affiliative behaviors. But then there seems to be another um, disruption that seems to be ongoing that just dramatically, like, con continuously, the, those affiliative behaviors started decreasing again. Um, we don't know why that is, but our hypothesis is that it could be because of waste buildup. Um, and one way to test that is to maybe change the cage at about three to four days and see whether that, that curvy linear relationship would disappear um, and just have that one disruption. So the conclusion from this study is that mice prefer to have separate sites for nesting and elimination, just like many other species. Uh, we found that these mice are willing to work to maintain a comfortable place to rest away from the latrine. Um, and we say that because they actively transported their nesting material um, into one cage and their bedding into another cage. Um, and we also found that this is independent of ammonia levels. These cages were well within the limits of these are IVCs, um, and even within that, so the mice just did not want to rest or spend a lot of time in the cage um, that have feces or urine. We found that a standard cage will thwart mouse ability to segregate their space because we saw that when they have more space, they will create a much larger distance between those clean and dirty sites. Um, and we also found that in the standard cage, they cannot segregate feces. And we also found some evidence that a complex system may lead to better welfare um, because it that system was associated with more locomotion and more affiliative behaviors. And finally, and, and another cool advantage of using a complex system is that it can save husbandry time. Um, because if mice only defecate and urinate and basically dirty one of the cages, um, only that cage needs to be changed, um, or at least every week that cage needs to be changed, and the other ones can be changed a lot less frequently. So that can save some resources there in technician time. Okay, so the general conclusion from everything I've talked about today um, is that we have evidence that the standard housing that we have for 
rodents used in research is preventing many natural behaviors that they seem to be motivated to perform um, and that we really should be updating um, our designs of, of the cages that we use to accommodate some of those behavioral needs. So thank you. And I just wanted to really acknowledge Dr. Dan Weary, who was part of all the studies I described today, and Dr. Becca Franks, who participated in the mouse study as well. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mikowska. We have a couple questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Are all the rat videos from the earlier studies available online somewhere? They are. Um, most of them are. So. Um, so this paper was published in Royal Society Open Science, so it's an open access journal, so you can you can access that. And as supplementary material, we provided links um, to these videos on YouTube. So yeah, most of them are there. Okay. And we have a couple other questions related to the rat studies. What was the playpen adapted from before it became the isolation cabinet? In, in sorry, in I need more. was that for the rabbit one at AstraZeneca? It, yeah, uh, it might have been. Um, I'm not sure I understand. So okay, so in that that okay, I'm just gonna cover them all because <laughs> I can't follow up. So for the rabbit one, it was they they were using it for rabbits originally. Um, didn't have any rabbits at the facility, so basically repurposed it to use with rats. I've heard of other people using ferret cages, for instance, um, or just even purchasing one or two ferret cages. Um, for use as playpens for their rat. In my case, I bought these playpens specifically to use as playpens. I bought two for the whole facility and yeah, use those. Okay, and there's another <laughs> question um, yep. relating to the rat studies. Do rats spend time being neophobic upon entering the playpens? Uh, really, really interesting questions. Um, yes, so you definitely see it you definitely see a difference in their behavior. So the first time they go in, um, they're a little reluctant. They'll spend most of their time on the top and they'll do a lot of sniffing. Um, but by the end of that first session, they are in the bottom level. They are putting their paws on the burrowing substrate, but not quite going in there. Um, but then by the second time, they're they're all in. And so by the second time, like, OK, I know what this is. And they 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 were a lot more active. But yeah, it does really take that one session for sure. Dr. Mikowski, we have a couple other questions coming mm -hmm. in. Were you able to try transporting the mice between cages using tunnel handling? Um, we didn't do that, but we used cupped hands. So like, yeah, those Jane Hurst papers, they basically show that, that handling the mice by their tails is, is not a good idea. They don't like it, but to use a tunnel or cupped hand. So that's, that's what we used, yeah, but not the tunnels. Okay. What are your thoughts on exercise cages used with animals participating in behavioral studies? Yeah. Um, I think the timing of when you do it matters. And I'm saying that because, so I showed the playpen of my colleague, Lucia, and so she was using, she was doing behavioral studies with her rats. And what she found, so she started a playpen with a group of rats who were quite older. They'd already participated in behavioral studies, and then she started putting them playpens right after their, their, their behavioral testing, and that, that, seemed, that was fine. She then got another group of really young rats, um, would always put them in playpen right after doing their behavioral testing. But what she found is they were so excited about the playpen that they didn't necessarily. So she was looking at their motivation to stay in the chamber that was filling with different euthanasia agents. Um, what she found is like they they just weren't really willing to stay at all. And it almost seemed like they were just too excited. It's like, OK, once as soon as I'm done this, I go into the playpen. So that that absolutely became a problem. Um, she then switched to putting them in a playpen at a completely different time of day. There was no more association and then found the same types of results as we always have with different groups. So I wouldn't discourage it. I would absolutely, you need to put all your animals through your control groups as well. Um, but yeah, be mindful that yes, it can change the motivation to do some things, but at the same time, it might make for more normal animals. So the results that you're getting perhaps might be more valid or translatable. So it's definitely something you need to think about. But I still think okay, Dr. <laughs> we have one last question. Mm -hmm. Is there any worry of cross-contamination when not cleaning between rat groups? 
Um, we didn't find any evidence of that. I think it depends on how clean your facility is. Ours was uh, quite a clean one. We weren't really worried about that. Never had any issues. Um, but yeah, it depends on your facility. And obviously, if you have that worry and you really need like super clean, sterile, then I would recommend cleaning it out. It's just obviously more work. Um, but if you had, for example, two or three sets of the pipe pens, you could kind of rotate them. Um, so as one group is in the pipe and you clean the other one, something like that. Okay, Dr. Mikowska. Um, thanks again to you. Yep. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Stay tuned in the coming weeks for the announcement of our next seminar. Until then, keep up the good science.